Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Neil Lane. I'm a senior fellow here at the Baker Institute for Science and Technology Policy. I want to welcome all of you to what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating evening. I'm sorry George Abbey, who runs our space uh, program here at the Baker Institute, was not able to be here this evening. Uh, had a conflict. He has a conflict that was unavoidable. The British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC, has put together, as I think you all know, a series of podcasts entitled 13 Minutes to the Moon. In recognition of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, a successful landing on the moon July 20th, 1969, the individuals who contributed to making Apollo a success are featured in each of the podcasts. The podcast portray not only the accomplishments, but also the setbacks and the challenges that had to be overcome each step of the way, leading up to the successful landing in July of 69. This evening's event will be recorded and will be uh, find the final podcast in the BBC series. We have a very distinguished group of four panelists and moderator this evening. Our first panelist is astronaut Walt Cunningham, who as lunar module pilot for the Apollo 7 mission flew along with Wally Schirra, the commander, and Don Isley, uh, the command module pilot. This flight in October of 1968 was the first manned flight of the Apollo command and service modules. He literally led the way as the successful accomplishment of this mission was critical to the achievement of the first lunar landing in 69. Our second panelist, Jerry Griffin, graduate of Texas A&M University School. <laughs> School right up the road here, many of you have heard of. Jerry served in the United States Air Force before joining NASA in 1964 as Gemini flight controller. In 1968, he became an Apollo flight director and served in that role for all of the Apollo manned missions. He was the lead flight director for three lunar landing missions, Apollo 12, 15, and 17. He subsequently served as the director of the Johnson Space Center from 1982 to 1988. Our third panelist, John Aaron, is a physics graduate of Southwestern Oklahoma State University in Weatherford, Oklahoma. Can't do better than that. Oklahoma is my home state, and I'm a physicist. So, thank you, thank you, John. Uh, Weatherford, as you all know, I think, was also the hometown of Apollo astronaut Tom Stafford. John also came to NASA in 1964 as flight controller in the Mission Control Center. He played an essential role in ensuring the successful accomplishments of the Apollo 12 lunar mission, was also instrumental in helping to ensure the safe return of the Apollo 13 astronauts. Our fourth panelist, astronaut Peggy Whitson, very much at home here at Rice University. Peggy received her PhD from Rice in 1985. It's a fine institution, as well as Texas A&M. <laughs> After working as a research biochemist at NASA, she became an astronaut in 1996. Peggy has, thrown, has flown three missions on board the International Space Station. She flew on Expedition 5, June 5th through December 7th, 2002, flying to and returning from the space station on the shuttle Endeavour. She flew Expedition 16, October 10th through April 19th, 2008, making the round trip to and from the station on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. Her third mission to the station uh, on September 3rd, 2017, flew again, she flew again on the Soyuz. Peggy holds the U.S. record for time and space, 665 days. And she was ready to go again, I think. <laughs> Our moderator and host to the panel this evening, Kevin Fong. Kevin is well known here at the Baker Institute. He's regularly participated in the International Space Medicine Summit. He is a medical doctor with special interest in space medicine. He holds degrees in astrophysics and medicine from the University College London, a degree in aeronautics and space engineering from Cranfield University, and has completed space medical training at both Johnson and Kennedy Space Centers. Currently, he's a practicing doctor in the UK, uh, working with the National Health Service, and he works as both an anesthesiology uh, anesthesia consultant at the University College of College London Hospitals and a flying doctor. 
with Kent, Surrey, and Sussex Air Ambulance. Driven by his love for space medicine, Kevin founded the Center for Altitude, Space, and Extreme Environment Physiology at the University College London in 2000 and he has worked with the British National Space Center, the UK Space Agency, and the European Space Agency to help further UK involvement in human space flight. So please welcome our distinguished panel and Kevin, uh, our host and moderator. Neil, thank you for that wonderful welcome. Uh, welcome, everybody. Lovely to see so many of you here tonight. Uh, I'm just going to start with uh, some, uh, uh, some housekeeping. Uh, or to, to begin with, I'm just going to have to... Uh, I can't stand up because of the earpiece. Um, 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 so I'm going to sit down. Um, uh, so uh, just a few things. So we're going to be recording this for the final uh, episode of the podcast series, um, 13 Minutes to the Moon, uh, for the BBC World Service. It's going to take uh, just a little over an hour, so if you will bear with us uh, and stay put during the recording uh, so we can get the recording clean. Um, uh, a few, few notices uh, just before we get going. If you have your mobile phone with you tonight, please do turn it off uh, or onto airplane mode to not interrupt the recording. Uh, there are no scheduled fire alarm drills tonight, so if you hear the alarm, go off, follow me and try to keep up. Um, uh, um, uh, and um, uh, we will record the whole uh, interview with our panellists. At the end, there'll be a few retakes to record, so please do keep your seats right at the end. We'll have a few more minutes at the end to, to continue uh, our recording. Uh, thank you very much for your patience with that. Um, before we start, I need to um, record, for, for the sake of radio, I need to record uh, some, some applause, really. Uh, and I, I, uh, I, so I'm going to start by calling you all in. I, I, I could hear there's a bit of a Rice, Texas thing going on in the audience already. So let's hear some applause for Texas. Yeah. Fantastic. And now let's have some applause for Rice. Jolly good. And let's have a round of applause for Her Majesty the Queen, just because we're here and it's me. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're about to get going. Um, by the way, there's no, no, no need for me to do any of that. I just like to hear some applause, really. So, so, um, so we're about to get going, uh, and we're going to play you in with some pre recorded stuff that Rami Zabar and uh, Andrew Luck Baker and I idiotically tried to record at two o'clock in the afternoon in the middle of Rice Stadium yesterday, um, cooking in the, in the sun. Uh, it goes on for about two and a half minutes. Before we play it, and before I forget, <coughs> I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Baylor, uh, sorry, I'd like to thank the Baker Institute. Um, I, I've been coming here regularly for many years now. And also I'd like to thank very much my colleagues and friends uh, who've supported me, <coughs> excuse me, over the years, uh, here in Houston, some of you are in the audience today at NASA. Uh, I've been coming backwards and forwards now for over 20 years. Uh, it's been a great honor. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to bring the message of, of all the great advantages that human space exploration brings to us here on Earth, particularly for medicine. This panel should be wonderful tonight, but, but to those of you in the audience who've been my friends and colleagues over all that time, thank you. To the uh, Baker Institute, thank you very much. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get going. We're going to start. We're going to play in two and a half minutes or so of us yesterday, and then we're going to get going with the main event. Thank you very much. <coughs> this is Rice University Football Stadium in Houston, the very place in 1962 that President John F. Kennedy chose to make his famous speech, rallying a nation to the great challenge of landing people on the surface of the moon before the end of the decade. I can imagine the electric atmosphere here that day, under the searing Texas sunshine, with the stands towering above me, packed with 40,000 expectant Americans, and the young president, where I am standing now, on the 50-yard line, at his podium, on this field. And this generation does not intend 
to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. We set sail on this new sea. Because that speech set the world on course for the greatest feat of exploration in the history of our species. So for the last podcast in our series, we thought Rice University was the perfect place to bring together a panel of people who've all played their part in the boldest adventure of all time. From the BBC World Service, this is 13 Minutes to the Moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Welcome to episode 12, 13 minutes to the moon, live. Okay, I'll flight controller. I'm at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy, just a few hundred meters from the stadium where President Kennedy made his speech. The focal point of the series has been the drama of the final 13 minutes before Armstrong and Aldrin landed on the moon on the 20th of July, 1969. And this podcast has been released 50 years to the day after those historic events. We're recording this in front of an audience here at the Baker Institute, and we've had the great fortune to be joined by a wonderful panel of people whose lives have been central to the endeavor of human space exploration. Apollo astronaut Walt Cunningham, former fighter pilot and a member of the very first crew to fly into space aboard any Apollo vehicle, Apollo 7. John Aaron, Apollo flight controller, known to some as the steely-eyed missile man whose quick thinking helped save more than one Apollo mission. John looked after the electrical and life support systems of the command module. Jerry Griffin, lead flight director for Apollos 12, 15, and 17, and who led the landings for two of those missions. He'd later become center director of the Johnson Space Center here in Houston. And our final member of the panel is former astronaut Peggy Whitson, the first female commander of the International Space Station. At 665 days, Peggy has spent more time in space than any other American astronaut, and she earned her doctorate in biochemistry here at Rice University. This is our panel. Now, we've plenty to get through tonight, um, and later we're going to be talking about our prospects for a return to the moon. Um, but let's start with that incredible speech made here in September 1962 at Rice. And I want to start with you, Jerry. Um, and can you remember where you were when you heard that speech, where you learned of that speech, and, and what you thought about it? Yeah, I had just gotten out of the Air Force and was trying to find my way to NASA. Um, I stopped by Sunnyvale, California at the uh, Air Force Satellite Test Center, which is where we 
flew some of the very first uh, secret satellites. But I was trying to get to NASA from the very beginning because I knew that's where I wanted to be. And when I heard President Kennedy say that we were going to do it in the decade of the, of the 60s, I thought to myself, I don't know about that. Uh, I'm not sure that's doable. But uh, when I became a part of it, we just kept plugging away at it, and uh, he was right. We made it. And, and John Aaron, uh, you were living in North Texas at the time, uh, about a million miles away from the space program. Um, what are your memories of that speech? What was your impression of it? I was actually further than that because I had just, gra had just graduated from a very small school in a very remote area. And I was at college totally consumed by my studies because I shouldn't have been there. I didn't have the appropriate <clears throat> to do it. So it hardly registered on me. I was living in a cocoon, trying to find to get the technical degree that I would wanted to pursue. And, and Paul, you were a fighter pilot at the time. You were, you were in the Marine Corps. And, Absolutely. And, and you heard this speech, this call to arms, as it were, to get to the moon before the end of the decade. What did you think to that? What do you think the chances were of achieving that? Well, at the time, <clears throat> I had joined the Navy out of high school, eventually became in the Marine Corps. And when this went on, I was not really cranked into everything that they did. <clears throat> but I was, uh, I think I was stationed in Korea at the time, fighter squadron. And along the way, I began to slowly realize that I ought to go to college. So uh, when I was about mm, 24, 25 years old, I transferred in the reserve squadron and started college and while I was at the college it came across what we were trying to do to go to the moon and uh, it's changed my life ever since. It was immediate appeal to me. And when you heard Kennedy's speech or when you learned of Kennedy's speech setting that goal of arriving on the moon before the end of the decade of the 60s, what did you think the chances were that we would achieve that goal? Uh, well, I was a fairly practical thinker at the time, and I was into physics, and I remember thinking he was overly optimistic because of all of the things that you had to be able to do to go. And frankly, I think it's one of the most amazing pieces of progress and objectives that we accomplished after announcing in advance, period. Now, Peggy, you're, you're forgiven for not remembering the precise detail of that speech because you were a toddler at the time. Um, but as a NASA astronaut during the shuttle era, you saw at least one attempt to reboot our lunar ambition, the, the vision for space exploration under George W. Bush. Why do you think it's been so difficult to get us back to the moon uh, in successive presidencies? Why do you think we haven't been able to, to really engage ourselves in the way that we did with Project Apollo? Well, Project Apollo, I think, had that political will motivating it and, and keeping it fresh the whole time, plus a considerable amount of the uh, national budget. I think since that time, we've obviously been somewhat hindered by not being able to spend that, that much money uh, to try and get a program off the ground. And the political whims from different administrations tend to change those priorities over time. And, in a faster way than we can actually complete a project. Um, and so really now I want to turn to what was the complexity of Project Apollo and something really that we've talked about in, in our series 13 Minutes to the Moon <clears throat> over and over again. Um, John F. Kennedy launched something that had never been attempted before, an endeavor so wide-ranging, so difficult, that it required an entirely new approach, and not just of a few hundred people, but hundreds of thousands of people working together all over the country, creating and then operating uh, the most complex system ever seen. So you people on the panel were the people controlling it, monitoring it, troubleshooting it when it got, got into problems for some of you trusting your lives to it. So uh, I wanted to really start actually with you, Peggy, because you flew as a shuttle astronaut on board the, the successor system, the shuttle, arguably the most complicated machine ever built. And what I want to know is, what is it like to trust your life to something that you yourself cannot be in control of? You can't see all the moving parts. What is it like to trust in a system like that? Well, I think there is a lot of trust involved, uh, but 
being part of that NASA team makes that trust work. And having people that can provide that input from, from the youngest engineer up to the most experienced makes you able to trust in that team. Uh, it was it was definitely risky in in some senses, but it was the one in 68. What the engineers said at the end of the shuttle program was the risk uh, of loss of life uh, for one of those flights. Uh, was a, a one in 68 eight. chance of catastrophic failure with the loss of the crew and the vehicle. Yes, and but that was nothing compared to what these guys did in the Apollo days. And, and I want to talk to you about that, Walt, because you know Peggy talks there about what sounds to me like a very high risk of potential catastrophic failure of a mission. But, but during Apollo, we didn't think of the, the risks in those precise terms, but they must have been much higher. What was your attitude towards the risks of, of, of the, the flights during the Apollo missions? Well, there is, there's no question that over the years, <clears throat> the safety and the attitudes we had had changed, but uh, also the people that we were taking up that were flying in later spacecraft uh, had a different attitude too. Uh, when I was there, starting in 1963, uh, we were all fighter pilots. Most of them were test pilots, and we were excited as all get out to have the opportunity to fly a, a mission like that. We wanted to fly the first mission, and we wanted to fly the landing on the moon. And I don't remember anyone in those days being overwhelmed by the risk of his own life. As a, as a fighter pilot, you always understand that that's a possibility, but you also develop the kind of attitude that says, it's not going to happen to me. There's a tiny little bit of you that knows that you might be wrong. <laughs> John, now you were a flight controller, and so your experience of the risk is, is slightly abstracted, not as direct as Walt's or Peggy's. But, and, and as a doctor, I sort of have some appreciation for that, you know, what it's like to make decisions and take risk on other people's behalves. But I wondered what it was like for you sitting in that seat in mission control as a flight controller to make decisions upon which other people's lives depended. I got introduced to risk uh, right up, right up front. Uh, when, when, when the Gemini spacecraft spun up uh, to uncontrollable roll rates, also uh, this first night I uh, <clears throat> served on the uh, Apollo program was the night of the fire. So I was introduced to risk uh, in a very vivid way. My approach to risk, being a flight controller, was that best way to prepare yourself to handle the unforeseen is to, is to learn everything you can about the design, the environment you're in, the operational situations that we're in, like the launch phase, and be there and feel prepared that if the worst thing happens, that you, that you can act and you can come up with the answer when maybe there's not an answer. That, uh, that is the way I felt comfortable walking into the room to do a launch phase, knowing the high energy situation that's involved. Uh, and, and of course, we will come to some of your stories of knowing what to do when the impossible has happened later in, in this episode. And I wanted to turn to you now, Jerry, and to talk to you as the flight director. You were kind of like the conductor of this orchestra. And to ask you what it was that enabled you to build a team of this caliber, of people like John and many others who were able to orchestrate this complex technology and make it work so that you could achieve your mission goals? <clears throat> yeah, being a, I had been a flight controller uh, in Gemini. And so when I was selected to be a flight director for Apollo, it was kind of natural, except I didn't play an instrument anymore. Like you say, I was, the director of the uh, orchestra. And um, you had to listen to all the parts and make sure they made the right, right sound and know when to tone this one down and bring this one up. Um, but it, it, was, it was a natural outgrowth, I think, of early 
high altitude, high speed flight test where our mentor was a guy named Chris Kraft. Chris actually developed uh, his initial skills at Langley in uh, high altitude flight test. And so that's where he started as being an architect of mission control. And um, I can tell you they made a conscious decision to go out and find some young people. Bob Gilruth, who was the center director at the time, uh, said, we want enough of the old heads around to kind of keep things calm, but we want some young people that uh, don't have too many preconceived notions uh, about space flight because nobody's ever done it. And so I'd like to start with their work on their brains. Well, anyway, I can tell you in mission control, it was the way we were wired. It was in our DNA that we liked the challenge. It was, I know you see pictures of us, we look pretty serious at times, but let me tell you, it was fun. In fact, it was a hoot. Uh, we had a lot of fun uh, in getting through even the tough phases, but, but that was the way mission control was, and we were, I think Peggy mentioned the teamwork. Uh, it was a team that, uh, and it was, we were teamed with the astronauts, those of us in mission control, all of our contractors, universities were the third leg of the stool. Uh, it played a big role. Great team. And you talk there, as we have often throughout this uh, podcast series, about the advantages of youth. Uh, the average age of a flight controller during the Apollo project was 26, I believe. Uh, uh, John Aaron himself, you were 26 during the Apollo 11 landing. You returned as center director at Johnson Space Center uh, through the shuttle era. Has NASA preserved that sense of youth as, as an asset? Uh, is mission control still filled with fresh-faced people as it was during the Apollo era? They're, they're a little older. Um, uh, regulations change, for one thing. Um, get more sensitive to uh, age discrimination of either being too young or too old. And um, I think the, the spirit is still the same, exactly. And uh, the people in NASA are really good. They are as good today as we were, probably better educated. Um, they just need to be given a mission and say, go do it. That was what we were told, go do it, and we did it. Now, um, we talk here really about the need for teamwork, but Walt, Every account of uh, Apollo astronaut selection is one of the fierce competition there was between you as fighter pilots, and fighter pilots were already competitive people. Just tell me what it was like to try and put aside that sense of competition and, and to work as a team, I guess, within Project Apollo. Well, I have to uh, confess to you, we weren't trying to put aside competition. <laughs> We were trying to make sure that we could operate and operate decently, recognizing that competition. But there was a big difference, like in the age, you know, the mission control people were all quite a bit younger. Uh, back, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronauts we were the ones that kind of carried us through that uh, the Apollo landings. But the average age uh, in our group at that time was probably in the mid 30s, but it went also up as high as the early 40s, one or two of them. Uh, and for us, it was a little bit different because it, would t it had taken us that long in our life to develop the kind of capability and experience as, a, as fighter pilots in uh, Air Force, Navy, and the Marine Corps on that. So for us, when we were being realistic, we understood that there was a risk there, but we also had the kind of confidence that comes, rightly or wrongly, with uh, crew members in fighter aircraft. So uh, I felt like it was just another place to be able to enjoy the kind of uh, exposure we had to that. And some of the people that we had in mission control, they were fighter pilots too that had been taken in there to uh, work on the uh, direction of it. Uh, as I look back on it now, I just feel fortunate to have lived when I did and be able to join that group. 
Peggy, um, you flew at a time when the astronaut corps looked very different, but you don't get to become a NASA astronaut without having competed in the first place. Tell me about how you balanced that, that I guess, the competitive spirit that gets you into the astronaut corps against the need to be the best team players that you can possibly be once you get there. Well, it's, it was really an important question. When I led uh, the selection board, we actually changed the emphasis of the crew members we were looking for. Uh, it became a much more, we had thousands of applicants that were technically competent, and we started looking more for those that uh, got the box checked from the report card that says, plays well with others. <laughs> it, that became a different priority, and we, we were evaluating that differently because for long-duration missions, that had much more of an emphasis for us. But yes, there, there was al always the competition of thousands of other applicants to get in. I think once we were in, obviously everyone still wanted to be the first in their group to fly, but there was much more of a camaraderie and team spirit. Sorry about you. <clears throat> well, the thing that's interesting is uh, back in our time, while we had that individual attitude that fighter pilots, everybody was a fighter pilot, that we had in those days, <clears throat> when we became part of a crew, whether it was two or whether it was three, it was the same as the militaries of working together in the same squadron or in the same uh, group of people you were flying with. Believe me, we all had a commitment for the total success of those missions on it. And we thought it was probably easier if there was just one of us involved in it because everybody tried to work together. Thank you, Walt. It's now time for me to turn to our audience for, for some questions. So we'll take one or two questions. Um, do we have any questions from the audience at all? Thank you. Uh, in the second row, uh, the gentleman in the uh, uh, white shirt there. <coughs> and if you just give us your name and let us know who you are. Yes, yeah, so my name's Ernie Seifert. Uh, I live in Prince Wood, south of here. The question I have is, is 50 years later, we've got a lot more technology. I hear You hear people saying you've got more technology in your watch than you had going to the moon. Is that going to make it easier for us to get there this time? Or do we have more hurdles to overcome uh, because we've got too much technology in the way? Thank you for that question. I'm going to turn to John for that one. John, you sat behind a desk managing the environmental control and life support systems, the electronic systems aboard, the Apollo spacecraft. What, what do you think about operating a spacecraft now versus, versus what it was like in your day? The, the, the main difference is the, uh, the technology is much improved. There's a, there's a much improved foundation to build an, uh, the next generation systems on. Uh, there's, there's a much better way of including artificial intelligence into those technologies. But the basic problem of how to, you know, have, how to have power and how to have environmental control and thermal control and all that, the, the physics is the same, but you can, you can build more redundant systems and have a, be both automated and uh, intel, intel, intel now than we had then. We couldn't, we didn't do that. We, we did not have the, art, the uh, computer technology to automate anything. We, it was slide rules and big chief tablets almost. And uh, that's, that's the primary thing that's changed, but the problem hasn't changed. It just, the way you uh, mechanize it, you've got a lot better options. The, there, is one, uh, there is one caution that I would apply that I found as we evolved into later space stations and so forth. Just because you have the technology to make a system complicated doesn't mean you should. <laughs> I've got a thought there. I'd like to add to that. I've got to move on. I'm sorry. Just okay. Oh, thank you. Um, we'll take one more question from the audience here. And we've got a young gentleman there on the right in the green shirt, second row. Thank you. Do you think NASA's biggest, what do you think NASA's biggest holdback currently is? Is it funding? Is it politics? Um, is it the current public insight, how NASA works? What do you think it is? What do I, what do we think NASA's biggest holdback is currently? I think that's one for Peggy Whitson. <laughs> 
Well, I think uh, NASA has to have, obviously, as you mentioned, you've got to have that political will, and it, it needs to be followed up with some money. But the other thing that is most important, I think, in our future development and future exploration is the fact that we're going to have to change how we do our processes to some degree. In order to do it in shorter periods of time, doing it with international partners and with these new commercial providers, if we can set up collaborative work that will allow both the government and the, those collaborators to benefit from those experiences, then I think we're going to be able to do things faster. And I think that'll be a huge, uh, a huge step up in the future. And I think that we are really on a precipice of change. We have that potential that it exists right now. And if we can push hard enough politically with enough money, I think we can really start and get back there where we need to be. Thank you, Peggy. Could I just ask you to identify yourself, tell us what you do and, and how old you are? Um, yeah, my name is Jason. I'm 14. I'm, I personally just love space, and I probably think right now that a lot of kids don't, you know, for my, example, my father, for him, it was always space. You know, it was what everyone was into, but now you don't see that at all. Like, kids just, you say NASA, oh, now it's more of a thing you wear for clothing, not something you think that's cool or you're actually hoping for people to go to the moon or anything. It's just something, oh, yeah, NASA, that's a thing. A future NASA administrator there, I think. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much for your question. Uh, that'll be the end of the questions for now. There'll be more opportunities to ask questions later. Thank you so much uh, uh, for your contributions there. Well, we're going to move on. Um, now, our focus for this series has been on the final 13 minutes of Descent to the Moon, which Neil Armstrong himself said was rampant with unknowns. And it was the culmination of all the hopes, dreams, and efforts of a nation over the previous decade. So let's just hear some of the mission audio now, about four minutes away from landing. We're going to play just over a minute of that because it's this audio that gave us the idea for the series in the first place. That sound is unique. It can't be mistaken for anything else. And so we're just going to play you a clip. Okay, all flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Control. Go. Telcom. Go. GNC. Go. Econ. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. Roger, understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Copy. Alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. 1201 alarm. Same time, we're go, flight. Okay, we're, we're go. go. Same time, we're go. Flight side right on, real good. Roger. 2,000 feet. Into the ag, 47 degrees. Roger. 47 degrees. How's our margin looking, Bob? It looks okay. We're okay. about four and a half. Roger. Eagle looking great. You're go. Altitude update in the ag. Looks good. Roger. Roger, 1202. We copy it. How you doing, Control? We look good here, fine. All right, how about you, Telcom? Go. Guidance, you happy? Go. Fido. Go. 700 feet, 21 down, 33 degrees. 540 feet down at 30, and at 15. Attitude home? Okay, at hold. I think we better be quiet. Right? Raj. Okay, the only call outs from now on will be fuel. Now, those last voices were Apollo 11 flight director Gene Krantz and Capcom Charlie Duke, just two and a half minutes before touchdown. Um, now, I'd like some of our panelists who were actually there that day listening to that audio live in the mission operations control room to put themselves back in, in, in the moment. Uh, so, so, Jerry, Jerry, I'll come to you first. Put us in that room. Well, I was plugged into the flight director console. Gene was actually running the, uh, the team then. Um, for one thing, it was very quiet. It was a very disciplined room most of the time anyway, but it was extremely quiet that day. We had been very close to landing on Apollo 10 uh, and intentionally didn't, uh, and, but we got down to 47,000 feet, uh, 47,400 to be exact. Um, but. At that point, we came back up and, and <clears throat> rendezvoused with the mothership, and, and I came home. It was a dress rehearsal. And the point I want to make in that is that until that final phase, 
we had done it all. Uh, and we had, we had checked out the, at least we'd done it once. But from there on, from about 47,000 feet on down, it was brand new. And the tension was there, but everybody was ready. And it was calm. Uh, I think confident until it got a little bit squarely on fuel there. He, we made a 60-second call, and then we made a 30-second and a 20-second, and uh, about to make a 10-second call when, uh, when he touched down and, and shut the engine down. And they went back later and calculated. They think they had about 17 seconds of fuel remaining. Um, that was by far the closest we got in any of the landings to uh, running out of fuel. But it was, it was uh, I think Neil knew better than we did uh, because we couldn't see anything. We couldn't, all we could do is read out the fuel. He could see. He knew what he was doing. He knew where he was going. And... Um, but it was a momentous step, but there was still no celebration, not yet. And, um, but we got them on the ground. Uh, and John, you were there. You're plugged in as a flight controller for Apollo 11, uh, monitoring uh, your systems. What's it like for you in, in what sounds like a frenetic last few seconds before the landing? Well, some of the audience may have heard me tell this before this way. I had the best seat in the house. My responsibility was to watch the command and service module, which was orbiting the moon 60 miles overhead with, and doing just fine. So I could just, I just kind of sit back, posted up some extra loops to listen to, communications loops to listen to. And then the drama began. There was, there was trajectory concerns about we're going to be long. There was the alarms were going off. The alarms were going off. And I, I got to watch that. I knew enough about everybody's position to know what they were working, why they were working, and what they were saying, what they were doing. And then you got down to the real terminal phase. And then the concern became fuel. It was, it was a drama that had pointed out Nothing like any simulation we had ever had, although we had hundreds of simulations of just that phase. There, when it, the touchdown happened, there was a sense, there was just kind of a hush and a sense coming to that room that was, was kind of awkward. And then, and then there was a reaction almost to start the cheers. And then we were reminded we just touched down. We may have to lift back off. Let's all, let's all pay attention to business. I got to watch that from the vantage point of not having to suffer the drama, but to watch it. Now, Walt, for you, of course, these are not just a crew, but, but your colleagues, people you've trained alongside your fellow astronauts. What was that like for you, listening to that on the loop? seeing how much trouble they were almost getting into? <clears throat> well, those of us that had already flown on Apollo but weren't there to do that, I, I would suspect that our attitude might have been a little bit different. But we were very much aware. Everybody on the flight crews in those days, everybody was aware of the kind of exposure you were at. Uh, done a lot of simulations. Uh, I don't know anybody that really... I can't swear this doesn't mean it's true, but that it was overly affected by that on doing the simulations. But some of the simulations we carried down to, to failure, so you kind of get used to it. But those of us at that time that had flown earlier in it, we were there listening to the, the crew coming down. And I, we might have been more <clears throat> impacted mentally on it than the crew because the crew was involved in doing it. I mean, so you had to log those things, but you don't want to ever get hung up on what is going on. You had to keep operating. Uh, that's a function of personalities, I think, but in those days when everybody was a, uh, a fighter pilot and had been, we'd been training for years actually to get to that point, that uh, we still felt like you are gonna push on to what it is. And now, in spite of all of that, I was 
I was very much impressed when they touched down with less than 20 seconds of fuel remaining. But at the same time, it's hard for the public to understand that uh, unless they were really ordered by the ground, which was what they talk about doing, they would have continued a little bit farther. They were aware pretty much also. Uh, and as long as they felt like they had a control to be able to abort, they would, they would keep doing it. So I was, I was thrilled to death that they had what it took to keep pushing to it. Thank you, Walt. Now, as we all know, Armstrong and Aldrin landed safely, but let's remind ourselves of that moment again. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twain. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Um, now, Jerry, uh, you were all breathing again, but it wasn't time for feet up and cigars out. Uh, tell me why. Well, being the first landing, you know, some people had said the dust will be so fine and so thin or there'll be a crust and you'll break through it. You could turn over or start to turn over. So we had to be ready for an immediate abort on the ascent stage, the second stage of the two. And... Um, we also then had a, what we called a T1 stay no stay. That was about a minute after launch. If we were, <clears throat> and the flight director would poll all the positions, if we were still okay after sitting on the surface, then they could do some additional powering down. Not all the way because we had a T2 stay that happened at about four minutes, I think, after touchdown. And at that point, if we were stable enough and everything looked good, uh, then we would give them the, the go to, for the T2 stay. Um, and so it was, you know, like I can remember exactly what John said when there was this silence after, right after touchdown and then a, a little bit of rumbling in the room, no, no yelling or standing up or anything like that. And Cran said, okay, hold it down. And it, and it went right back down to zero. And uh, because... And then they got into the T1 and T2 stay no stay. Uh, so it was uh, exhilarating, but the mission wasn't over. And so I think everybody in the control center thought of it that way. We got a long way to go here. Uh, we got them down. Now let's do something else. Uh, Walt. Uh, <clears throat> I do have a thought of that because uh, the situation has changed so much in our world of spaceflight today. Uh, in those days, they were landing on another body in the universe, and so little was known about it that it really came down to the feel there at the end. We now talk about going to Mars, and the public may not realize that we know probably, I don't know, a hundred times, a thousand times more about Mars and the Mars surface today than we knew about the moon in those days. So the, cha the, the risk is changing on it, but it takes an attitude that you cover those things. I'm absolutely amazed with how much we know about Mars today. Thank you. And we may come and talk more about our future ambitions uh, later in this program. So three and a half hours later, Neil Armstrong opens the hatch, climbs down the ladder, with an estimated one billion people on Earth watching or listening. And for the first time in 12 episodes, here's the mission audio with some of the most famous words of all time. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Surface is fine and powdery. I can, I can pick it up loosely with my toe. I only go in a small fraction of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch, but I can see the footprints of my uh, boots and the treads in the Fine, sandy particles. Now, Peggy, you were nine years old, but you have a memory of this. Tell me about that. Well, my parents let us stay up late. 
that was a big deal. <laughs> we didn't get to stay up late for any reason. And uh, they actually, I remember being in my pajamas and watching on a really old, cruddy black and white. I know the video wasn't great in any case, but our, our TV wasn't great either. So you're trying to pick out, you know, are they really stepping down? But it was, I don't think I understood as a nine-year-old the, the total significance of the event, but it certainly made an impression on me. And it's one that lasted and one that made me want to become an astronaut. So it was very inspiring to me. Um, and I thought, wow, cool job. <laughs> And eventually, I, I saw other female astronauts get picked the year I graduated from high school, and it became a, a goal to become an astronaut. And you, uh, in your career as an astronaut aboard shuttle and on space station, became one of the most experienced spacewalkers, uh, uh, I guess, of, of all time. Spacewalk doesn't quite cover it, does it? I mean, I mean, it's the most dangerous thing we do in space. Explain to me why it's so hazardous. Well, obviously, we're, we're basically in a spaceship built for one. And so we have all those life support systems inside. We have a suit that protects us, but maybe not as much as, as a spacecraft would. But we, we are out there, and we're working with the pressure of the suit against the pressure of the suit. The, that pressure protects us, but it also makes it much harder to work in that suit. So it's just it's one of the most, um, I would say, difficult from a mental and physical perspective, but at the same time, that's what makes it one of the most special parts of the job of being an astronaut. Now, well, here we're talking about Armstrong walking on the surface of the moon, um, collecting samples that will be important for the scientific legacy of Apollo. But your colleague, um, fellow astronaut Frank Borman, once said that he was a Cold War warrior wasn't really interested in picking up rocks. Um, uh, and I wondered what it was like for you, what your attitude was. Was it all about, as a pilot, was it all about the flying, or was there something in the exploration for you? Uh, well, at that time, actually, I was very jealous. But uh, the job itself of landing a man on the moon, which uh, Neil did, but that's a little bit different than some of the other things we did because it, there's a mental aspect of that. So I was terribly impressed by it. I was very, very jealous of it because I had been, well, five flights before we had flown. Uh, and when Frank Borman went there, Frank Borman was very well qualified. He had uh, been in charge of the investigation for the fire that had preceded our particular mission on that. but. Uh, uh, he was one of the few people that you know, had a problem with the zero gravity also. You know, about 25% of our guys were sick there for a little while, some of them maybe a little bit more. Uh, on Apollo 7, for example, I can remember that none of us had felt really uh, affected by zero gravity, and we'd even gone through trying to find out how you might do that. So we were very much impressed with what they did on it, but more than anything else, I'd say we were jealous. <laughs> and but, but Walt, during your training, amongst other things, you were trained to analyze geological samples. Um, how, interested I, how interested were you in that compared to, say, learning how to fly the, the command module? Uh, well, actually, we, I think we, probably all of us were uh, resigned to putting up whatever the what the uh, environment was at it because there had been uh, earlier guys that had flown. I think I was 18th American, something like that. And if the other people could do it, I felt that our bodies would adjust it too. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, except for kind of a, a, a cold exposure that... Uh, that uh, Wally Shaw had had, we had absolutely no feeling at all of informality and confusion on it when we got to zero gravity. Uh, and we expected that a lot more people would escape it cleanly than, than actually did, really. Um, John, uh, what are your reflections on seeing Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walking on the surface of the moon July 20th, 1969? You know, as I, as I sat there and I watched and I listened, 
as it, as it came down the ladder and planted his foot. Personally, what it meant to me, I felt, you know, kind of a cold chill kind of come up on me. And the f and pride just welled up. I mean, you're going to get me kind of going here. But, but then the pride of the, the whole team, the 400,000, probably felt the same way. And then afterwards, I started thinking about what it meant to the country. You know, in the late 50s, in the late 1950s, I grew up in the duck and cover training. Cold War was raging. The, the mood and morale of the country was down that, you know, our, our technical and engineering proudness wasn't perhaps what it should be. And then I think that was a watershed event for how people felt about themselves to be Americans. And from that moment on, uh, we were not only caught up with the Soviets with respect to the space race, we have made a leap ahead. It also set up an export accelerant looking forward on, the, on our, our technological evolution and digital communications and digital computers and so forth that it caused a big leapfrog in that. So it was a watershed event, both personally is what it meant and also what it meant to the country. Thank you, John. Jerry. You're in Mission Control, Apollo 11 are on the surface of the moon. Um, at what point can you, as a flight director, relax and say, that's it, job's done? Well, no. never uh, <laughs> is probably the way I'd answer that. Um, you know, it's interesting. I had a, a cold or a chill moment like John did, but it wasn't when he stepped on the moon. It was a call that Buzz made at about 40 feet. And he threw it in between his normal calls. He said, picking up some dust. Mm -hmm. And it still sends a chill up my back. Because I realized we had two humans and a, an American rocket that was blowing dust that they could see off the surface. And that's when I said, we're going to land. This, this is going to work. And um, so it kind of stole my thunder uh, in that moment that, that I didn't, that I kind of missed when he stepped off. Um, it, something that Peggy said about being this, the spaceship for one, I was always nervous in EVAs. Um, there were a lot of single point failures that, and we didn't like single point failures. We always tried to drive them out of the system. But uh, you put a person in a suit, pressurized suit, uh, you could snag it, hurt it, hook it, do something that, that could be uh, really bad. Now, the Apollo 11 crew didn't get very far from the lunar module. Later, you know, we had people uh, miles away from the lunar module. And I don't know, I was, uh, every time you opened a hatch, it kind of bothered me. Uh, you got to close the door, you know, and pressurize this thing and, and uh, get it going. But uh, that moment was... Uh, historically uh, meant a lot more to me than it did in, in the moment when uh, he uh, uh, stepped out. Um, now, much of this series uh, has explored the, uh, the jeopardy of the Apollo 11 landing, but none of the Apollo missions after 11 were without their problems. And by way of example, two of our panelists were intimately involved in the next mission, Apollo 12, just four months after the first moon landing, and that mission was struck by lightning very shortly after launch. Now, I'm going to ask Jerry to put me into the picture for this. So this is Apollo 12 launching, and all hell breaks loose. Tell me what happened. Yeah, Apollo 12 was um, my first time to be on duty for a Saturn V launch, which was uh, an experience in itself, even if it worked right. Um, about 35 seconds after liftoff, um, all of a sudden, our data on all of our uh, computer screens uh, froze uh, and, and jumbled. It didn't make any sense, and, it, and they stopped. Um, Pete Conrad was the commander. 
and almost immediately he started calling out the master caution and warning lights, which were essentially all of them on a panel about this big. He started calling out all the master caution and warning that he was seeing. Main, the voltages were uh, in the red, all kinds of things. My first thought was we may have to have to, have to abort. We were still gaining altitude, so I said, let's keep going and get up high enough where the parachutes can, can work, get rid of that escape. We had an escape tower. It was not a good ride. But we were right on the trajectory, so we kept going. And about that time, I said, I knew it was electrical or something because everything had gone well. Um, I said, uh, Ecom, what do you see? And John, you said, White, tell them to try XCE Rocks. And I said, I looked at John. John had stood up and looked at me. And I said, what? <laughs> uh, and he said, he repeated it, SCE to AUX. So I turned to the Capcom, who was now looking at me. And I said, Capcom, SCE to AUX. And he looked at me with this, what? Look, and uh, but he went ahead and made the call, and called it up to uh, Conrad, and he said, uh, "Try SCE to AUX," and Pete r repeated it, "NCE to AUX." Um, what the hell is that? <laughs> and uh, so we had this comedy of errors running around through all these com loops, but Albine. The lunar module pilot knew where the switch was that John had made the call on. It was right in front of him, and he went from the primary to the auxiliary position. We'll tell you later what that was. When that, when that happened, we got all the data back uh, in the control center. And John, at that point, stepped in and said, T Tell him to reset the fuel cells, flight. So Capcom reset the fuel cells. And Albine had, uh, was going to do that maneuver. Uh, there were three switches. And uh, he was very slow in doing it. He told us both later that he didn't like that idea, that uh, <laughs> when you start fiddling around with the power, uh, the fuel cells produce power. And uh, he said he didn't, just didn't feel right doing that. So he put on one, and John said, He's got one, uh, tell him to get the other two. So he did, and when he did, it restored all the power back in the spacecraft, and all those lights went off. So, and, and this is one of the remarkable stories of Apollo. And, and John, Aaron, you are 26 years old in your first job out of college, I guess. Um, how do you know that this is the right thing to do? Apollo 12 has been struck by lightning, Every light mm -hmm. on the console is on saying you should really abort, but you say no. Make this bizarre switch throw, SCE to AUX. How do you know that? Well, the first thing that I noticed about the data and listening to what the crew was reporting, and by the way, we didn't know it was, it was lightning at that not, point. Not. We just knew that, that our sense there's probably a major brownout of the power system that was going on in the spacecraft. There, the thing that I saw, I realized quickly I had seen it before. The, it was a, there was about 50 parameters that this black box worked on to try to condition it and orchestrate it and package it to, to go down on the downlink. There was about 50 power parameters that this, this, this box called the SCE, Signal Conditioning Electronics, operate on. And one, zoom back in time one year, I was sitting in mission control at that same console in the middle of the night after a long day of pad tests where the famous quotes were something like, you know, have we ever gonna get this test done? And they made an error in the sequence. When they, this is on a live spacecraft. They made an error in the sequence and set up the condition of dropping the whole spacecraft loads on two batteries. Bang, all the lights came on, 
I'll, you know, master alarm, main bus undervolt, main bus B undervolt. And I looked at my screen when that happened, and it had this crazy looking nonsensical pattern for these 50 parameters. Well, late I died, I went home, but the first thing I did the next morning, I sat down with uh, one of the, the experts in that system. We spent all day explaining to ourselves why that pattern showed up. It turned out though, that the primary conditioning box, black box, had an under voltage sensor in it. It tripped it off, and that was its reaction to the trip. The secondary, I knew uh, by the end after looking at it, that it, secondary didn't have an under voltage sensor, and I thought, well, it might work. But the thing that happened, I just happened to be the right person on the right console at the right time to see a pattern that I had seen before. And it was a pattern I had memorized a year earlier, but totally forgot about it. But what had happened was this lightning strike had kind of tripped yeah. out one circuit. And that simple switch through from SCE to AUX put in a second circuit that meant that the whole machine yeah, could continue. It, it did that. It, and that was the reason I was trying to get to it. because. I knew the data was fake. What I really wanted to do was I looking at was I looking at the cause or was I looking at the effect? That's always the first thing you have to figure out once you troubleshoot something. So the uh, as soon as we got it to auxiliary, then the data came live, and then I could tell, oh, the uh, fuel cells have all been tripped off the bus. They were the primary power supply for the spacecraft. And I said, reset the fuel cells. Funny name for a switch, uh, but it may be that probably contributed to why he right. was, that Alex. sounds like he's going to do a control walk delete or something. <laughs> uh, but he tried one, and then the bus voltage came up, and that, and it's one of those things that I can't explain any different than that about me being there. Okay, and the next flights, of course, get into even bigger trouble. Apollo 13, on its way to the moon, uh, suffers an explosion which cripples its life support and, and its source of power, with the very real risk of, of seeing an astronaut crew being marooned in space. Now, Walt, um, one of the things that really struck me when, when we interviewed you for the podcast series was that your, your statement that nobody seriously expected us to complete all the flights to the moon without losing at least one crew during a flight. When you became aware of the Apollo 13 crisis, did you think that this might be a crew that you were going to lose in flight? <coughs> well, it's, uh, it's an interesting question, but uh, it wasn't an, an official <coughs> kind of policy that said we're going to lose one time. I'm just talking about <laughs> the crews themselves uh, Everybody thought we had utmost confidence, which we did. We had self-confidence, what have you. But I can remember in conversations, even when I'm just flying with some of our guys and the crews, we, uh, uh, well, maybe I'm the only one who's willing to say it at the time, but we thought that uh, when we landed on the moon on the fifth flight, that uh, before we even started off on the Apollo 7 mission, we all thought that there would probably be some loss of at least one crew in there, and it would just take another mission to do it. And that has to do with the attitude that you have when you're in this kind of a position. Uh, and I'd have to say this, too. Probably every one of us that might have a little talk from time to time and say, oh, we're going to lose some crew, nobody thought it was going to be their crew. I mean, everybody realized that there were things that, that could cause it, but they all had the confidence, the same confidence that I had, Wally Sharon, Don Isley had, is uh, if we get an emergency here, we'll be able to handle it. Now, is that correct? Probably not, but it's the way we felt about it. It's an attitude. Um, Jerry, Apollo 13, by all accounts, was chaotic, really, from the moment you have that problem with the explosion and you're losing almost every critical system on board the vehicle and they're headed away from the Earth 25,000 miles an hour or so. Tell me about what it was like to try and manage that chaos. Yeah, I had just gotten off shift. <laughs> and I, t I tell, Gene Kranz happened to be on shift when the tank exploded. I uh, told him I turned over a perfectly good spacecraft to him and he blew it up. But 
Um, I actually came back in the room about the same time John did, uh, 40 or 50 minutes probably after the explosion. And um, I was out playing a softball game. Somebody had to come get me. And, um, but anyhow, the, uh, the room was calm. It was not chaotic. There were more people in the room. And uh, by the time, about the time I got there is when they made the call to get over into the lunar module and use it as a lifeboat. And I remember about 13, probably the most fortunate thing that happened. If it had to happen, it happened at the right place. We still had the lunar module. Had that happened after they had separated the lunar module and landed, um, it was curtains. It, it wouldn't have worked. Uh, we could have gotten, we could have probably gotten uh, uh, swaggered home, but uh, that would be about it. And uh, so it, it was a chaotic time, but that's when the training kicked in. And one thing else, and I'll make this quick, one of the secrets, maybe the primary secret of Apollo was the training. And I am amazed at the fidelity of simulations we had 50 years ago. When I think about it, we had the astronauts in one building and a simulator. We had the control center in another building. We were connected. The data that we saw inside the control center looked just like a real flight and the simulation guys were in between us and they could throw in failures and they did and they would drive us to our knees and we sometimes have to abort and sometimes we wouldn't but eventually what we did through that process is the training taught us not only about the systems it also taught us how to face a serious problem so I think that was one of the big uh, things that we had to do in 13 that was was really stay focused. And uh, John, you yourself play a key role in the rescuing of the Apollo 13 mission. Just tell me your recollections of that. When the problem happened, I was home. I didn't know what was going on, and I got a call. They said, John, um, they've got a problem out here, and they're chasing it, trying to diagnose it, and they're chasing it, think, pretty con convinced it's, it's some kind of instrumentation problem. It's, it's a bunch of bad measurements coming down the spacecraft. So I said, walk behind the consoles and read me some measurements. Because I, I knew all the electronics that, that aggregated those kind of measurements. And they read, it, they read them out to me. I said, well, you, read me these. They read them out to me, read these. And I said, that is not an instrumentation problem. That's a real problem, and I'll be right there. I then walked, I would then thought on the way driving into the control center, I ran through my mind what could that be and what so forth. And so I went to the control center and looked at what people were trying to diagnose and chase. And then we began the process of, of making the inevitable call that you had to turn the command module off. Very traumatic call to make because that had never been done before in orbit. We, we, didn't, we, never, we didn't know how to really to turn it back on. But it was time to start the troubleshooting and, and focus on the lifeboat. And uh, that, that I was uh, helped get in place that you're not gonna fix this you got to turn it off and save the batteries because we, if we get back in the vicinity of the earth by some miracle, we're going to need those. And it's an epic story and perhaps a subject for another podcast series, but, uh, <laughs> but an incredible story of, uh, of triumph, really, for NASA yet again. Um, uh, but Peggy, you, uh, what, what's miraculous to me is that during the whole of the Apollo program, we didn't actually lose a crew in flight. And yet you yourself as an operational astronaut flew through the shuttle era. Uh, we lost two vehicles and their crews. You yourself were in the astronaut corps uh, when we lost Columbia in 2003. I wanted to ask, uh, you know, we know the risks, we know the numbers mathematically, but when you experience a risk at close hand like that, does it modify your attitude to the risks? Well, it definitely it's going to have an effect. Obviously, um, knowing people 
that you've lost uh, makes a huge difference, I think, in maybe how you perceive it. But I, I think I, I knew there was risk before I was at NASA. I was still here at Rice University uh, in my PhD postdoctoral phase, and that's when Columbia or, or, yeah, uh, Challenger. Challenger happened. And so even then, I knew there was risk. And maybe I didn't understand the minutia of how we got into that problem. But obviously, when I got to NASA, that's one of the things as a manager you learn. And they teach us about that, uh, the Challenger accident, because they want us to not fall into the same traps that, that management uh, fell into as part of that disaster. So risk is part of the job. I, I think you can't deny that it's not that it's there. Uh, and but I think the fact that we have a day of remembrance every year to actually acknowledge it and understand it and, and think about it so that we don't repeat it is important. Now, uh, the United States is, of course, thinking of going back to the moon in the near future. But, but as we've heard, that involves a huge amount of risk. Uh, we've talked about Apollo 12 and Apollo 13. Apollo 15 itself had a hard landing. Uh, 16, 17 weren't straightforward. The whole endeavor of human space exploration is always fraught with danger. I guess I want to ask our panel, do we need to prepare ourselves as a society if we're going to prosecute these missions in the future, if we're going to take on these missions into the future? Is society as a whole prepared to accept those risks? Um, uh, Walt, is society prepared for the risks that it needs to accept if we're going to send people back to the moon and onwards? <coughs> Uh, my personal opinion is that today, I don't believe that the public at large is oriented towards accepting risks, physical risks like this, as uh, we used to be. That's not the total solution, but it does change a lot about the reaction to it. Uh, <clears throat> almost everything that you've been talking about here, about the problems with uh, 13 or or 12, or what have you. They may seem unique now, but at the time, those of us that were training for all those missions, sometimes backup, what have you, uh, there was always, in my opinion, a built-in capability to adjust and handle it at the same time. There was always that piece of that that said, if we can't get this done, we've got the ground down there that can try to do it. And the ground, as a matter of fact, was able to go through some of those kind of in-flight emergencies, <clears throat> excuse me, but uh, the, ground, the crew had already handled most of that stuff. Uh, for example, we talked about uh, Apollo uh, 13. I lived across the street from the Johnson Space Center. And when I heard this was, uh, TV was finally, forced to cover it, because they hadn't been covering it, uh, starting with that one there. And uh, I was getting ready to go to bed. I put my clothes on. I went across, went into mission control. When I got there, I was listening to uh, Jack Swigert, who was the last minute substitute or replacement on there on Apollo 13. But Jack and I had worked together for a couple of years, working on all the uh, <clears throat> malfunction procedures and developing malfunction procedures. I'm sure that you remember him, him there too. I sat down there. I stayed there for about 15 minutes. I listened to what was going through uh, Jack uh, on the air to ground. The other guys were in the lunar module already trying to uh, open it up and get it set to, to cover for them. And I went home, went to bed. And I went home, went to bed because I felt like they had done and was on the track for everything they could possibly do. And then from that time on, it was going to have to be a function of analyzing other things. <clears throat> now, the attitude in our society, in our culture, has been changing in the last 50 years. And uh, I don't have the same automatic reaction of, of feeling really comfortable about it. But I'm sure that some of that applies. It's the reason and the way we can do it. Jerry, we want to go back to the moon. You've been part of an operation that got us to the moon once before. What do we need to do today to get back there? Well, I, 
Peggy hit on it earlier, uh, consistent funding is extremely important. <clears throat> um, and we got to get, I think, ultimately, we're going to have to have the Democrats and Republicans talking to each other. In Apollo, we had three presidents. Two of them were Democrats and one Republican. And with all the problems we had, the fire, Apollo 13, and so forth, we said, let's go, let's keep going. Um, the Congress, at the same time, uh, was split more than once between Republicans and Democrats, uh, particularly in the House and the Senate, I think. Um, but they talked to each other, and we had a commitment. So it, at the bottom line, we've got to have the commitment uh, and the public support if we're going to go on back to, I think we've got to go to the moon first and then to Mars. Uh, it's been 50 years since we've flown in deep space, and I can tell you it's different. It's different than Earth orbit. Earth orbit has got plenty of risk, but there's something different about deep space flight that brings another element to it. For one thing, you can't get them home from the moon. You know, it takes about three and a half days. So anyway, it, we got to have some consistency um, or we don't have a chance. John, do you think society has the right attitudes towards risk, understands the risks of putting people out there onto the moon, maybe further going beyond? Well, I'm going to pick up on what he said. I mean, I was there when, the, when Kennedy made the speech, and I was there when we started getting real serious about our space program. And all, although we didn't lose any lives in the, in, the, in the process of doing that, if for those of you who have seen those old documentaries, we had some spectacular failures <clears throat> on a, a major blows. <clears throat> and because the country had that commitment, then we were not second guessed. They didn't shut us down as informal commission. They let us keep going. I think the difference is you got to have that condition, commitment that there's a real, real reason why you're doing this. And of course, it's even tougher today with this uh, media machine that has been built uh, as they constantly look for fodder to feed the machine. It, uh, I don't have a good answer for how to do that other than you've got to have the will to keep going. How to do that is a, is a <clears throat> tough question. Peggy, um, we've seen some false dawns in our efforts to return and reinvigorate our desire to go back to the moon, embark on deep space exploration. Do you think this current initiative has a real chance? I think it has more of a chance than it, than it has maybe on some of the previous instances. And largely that's because I think we have a demonstrated capability as with international partners, you know, 20 years of human presence in space on the International Space Station is not trivial, and it, there were lots of hurdles in that process. But I think the important thing is that we've also added in the commercial providers for cargo and hopefully crew in the near future. And if we can keep adding in more and more commercial providers to give us, have them help us get that innovative flavor back into NASA a little bit faster, you know, to make things happen a little faster. I mean, I really do think we have it. A, a chance, but we do need that, that political will and consistency with the funding to go with it. Thank you. Um, we're going to have to move on to our last set of questions from the audience now. So if there are any questions from the audience, I'd be very happy to take them. Uh, there is a, a lady in the middle of the third row here, polka dot top there, thank you. And if you just give us your name and tell us who you are. Hi, my name's Laura Glean. I live here in Houston. And Mr. Aaron, you spoke of sort of the, the pride that swelled within you at the big public moment of the landing on the moon. I'm wondering if there are smaller, more private moments, either in the build-up to Apollo 11 or Peggy, that you sort of taken from there, sort of everyday moments when you've thought, this is NASA, this is what we're about, this is everything that's sort of the culmination of all our efforts, this is the good that perhaps you want to make public now. John? 
You're going to have to repeat the question. Uh, 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 you were being asked it. Um, you know, there was talking about the sense of pride you had during the landing on the moon, but are there other moments in your life where you feel, you know, smaller moments of pride that, that stem from everything you achieved through NASA, everything that was done through your efforts at NASA? Well, the, 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 the other team that I worked with, in addition to what I thought was the Apollo team, which I thought was the best team in the world to work with, I found another one. And that's the ones who built the space shuttle. Uh, the day that the first time we uh, tried to launch the, the uh, space shuttle to orbit, we didn't go. Uh, the, the two computers decided that they did not want to talk. But we were, you know, fortunately, we were able to sort that out in a very short period of time. And then two days later, we launched uh, some very brave men on an unmanned, on a manned vehicle for the first time. That was a great achievement that uh, the uh, building of the avionics and system for the uh, space shuttle. NASA can put together great teams, and that's what I take great pride in that. Thank you. Uh, Peggy. I, I've always said I think NASA's motto should be making hard things look easy because we do it routinely. You know, there, there's you know, little instances, you know, broken toilets, or there's big instances. We had a torn solar array, and it, it was a heroic effort, uh, you know, of multiple teams working 24-7 to come up with a solution to fix a, a torn solar array, and, and in four days it was done. And I've been on the ground side uh, watching those Team Fours, we call them. They're kind of a spin-off of what they developed in the uh, Apollo 13 era of having a separate team working the, the critical problem so that the main control team can continue uh, and work the real-time issues. And then the other teams are working all these problems. And it's just amazing to me that you know so many people can can split off these problems and work them and tack them, come back together, say this isn't going to be an option you know, anymore because of X or Y, and, and that teamwork is just phenomenal. It's, I, it makes me proud all the time. Jerry? I was going to say, um, <clears throat> I think everybody knows we had a tragic fire on Apollo 1, and um, three of our good buddies were, were killed in that. And I, I, right after that, before Apollo 7, which was the first man flight, I was made a flight director. And I think one of the, and I worked on 7 as a, I had a shift on 7. And um, I think one of the proudest moments I had was when 7 worked and splashed down. And Walt Cunningham was on that flight. It was one of the most important flights that we ever had. Because had it not worked, the program was over. It would have ended. If we just had a tragic fire, it would have been. And the Apollo 7 um, solution put us on our way. Uh, it worked. And uh, well done. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. Uh, we will take one last question here. Um, uh, let us go over here. Uh, actually, here, gentlemen, just there. Yes, thank you very much. Let's give us your name. My name is Opreet Singh. I'm CEO of Imatics uh, Local. You're going to have to speak up a little bit because okay. you're not amplified. Uh, you, are, you are on that microphone. It's just not amplified for us. My name is Harpreet Singh. I'm CEO of a local biotech company called Imatix, working on cancer research with MD Anderson Cancer Center. First of all, let me express it's a true privilege listening to such a group of pioneers and heroes. Thank you very much. Okay. Here's my question. Uh, being out there, literally in outer space, um, is probably the biggest change of vantage point a human being can experience. What does that do to the human mind, seeing planet Earth down there? What does being out in deep space do to the human mind? Uh, we've got two people on our panel qualified to tell us. Um, um, <laughs> Walt, what does being in space do to the human mind? Uh, well, I, can't, I can't recall during our time that it had an impact on the human mind. 
Uh, some people developed a maybe more positive attitude about it. I can remember on our mission, Apollo 7, uh, it made us uh, appreciate more what work we'd done. We added a couple of uh, mission objectives because it was going okay, but it was not easy. It was not comfortable, and we just worked our tail off. Uh, the situation in the world today is, is changing. We've been talking about uh, Apollo and uh, going to Mars. Um, we've got to start realizing that and, and make sure the costs are understand. For example, the entire Apollo program was $25 billion. It was all those landings. Today, that uh, if you adjusted it for inflation, you'd be talking about 100, and maybe 150 billion dollars, or right close to that. And yet, we talk about doing things cheap. Well, efficiency enables you to do things cheaper than they were, but also the dollars are different. Now they're talking about some people are talking about going back to the moon, setting up a base, which it makes some sense to me. They also talk about uh, going off to Mars. And they talk about it as if they can go do a landing like they did on the moon. One, that's not the case. Uh, and secondly, I have to tell you, the unmanned exploration of Mars today has been amazing, amazingly good. But human interest is going to see that sometime in the future, we'll, we'll put humans there to do it. So, but right now, we know, I wouldn't know whether it's 100 or 1,000 times more about Mars than we knew about the moon when we went to the moon. And so it's going to take a while before you've got the real duration and feel the, the, the forcement you know, to, to get back, uh, to go to Mars with humans. I'll be long gone, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised to find out if everybody in this room is gone when we finally get back to <laughs> Mars. Peggy, um, what, are, what are the effects of, you've flown in space more than any other American. You know better than anyone. What are the effects of spaceflight upon the human mind? I think from, uh, for myself, from the psychological perspective of being in space that long, the, the biggest message, the biggest lesson I think that you take away is this perspective, this perspective of what our planet is. We're up there orbiting the Earth, trying valiantly to recreate the life support system uh, in a very mechanical way that's provided by this planet below. And that the atmosphere is so thin and it just gives me a huge appreciation for the fact that spaceship Earth needs to be taken care of it because there's only one atmosphere and we're all gonna eventually be sharing all of that. But the other part of the perspective it provides is when you look out to the stars and you can see so many stars, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands and knowing that there's uh, billions of other galaxies just like this one. And that perspective give, goes from, you know, thinking <clears throat> how important our planet Earth is and having that perspective of the importance of this place and who we are. And then, you know, being just less than a grain of sand uh, on the beach of this cosmos, it's pretty amazing mm -hmm. perspectives. I was, you know, you ought to also realize. <laughs> you ought to also realize that the communications you had, which you couldn't get away from at all, greatly exceeded the four and a half percent air and ground communications we had back in the 1960s. But we were very glad we didn't have to have the ground talking to us more than that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that sadly has to bring our discussion to an end here at Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. Uh, Enormous thanks uh, to them for hosting us today and, of course, to my fantastic panel, Peggy Whitson, Jerry Griffin, John Aaron and Walt Cunningham. Uh, please join me in thanking them. Thank you very much. <laughs>